All right. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, everyone, wherever you are. Thank you for joining us. Uh, we will give it just a few moments uh, as we let people load in uh, to the webinar room, and then we'll get going in a, couple, uh, in a minute. All right, let's get going. Uh, so welcome to APA Hacking 101. Thank you uh, for joining us. As I mentioned, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are. And thanks for joining us. Welcome to today's webinar, APA Hacking 101. My name is Dan Gordon, and I lead the technical evangelism team here at Traceable AI. And I'm happy to be your host today. We've got some great knowledge to share with you, but before we get into that, just a little bit on logistics and housekeeping. So today's session is being recorded and it will be available uh, to you after the session uh, through Bright Talk channel. Uh, we welcome questions in the webinar control panels uh, below the video. You should see a QA button. And if you uh, press on that, you can an uh, enter questions and we'll do our best to get to those and answer those at the end of the session, towards the end of the session. With that, I'm very proud to be able to introduce today's speaker, Dr. Katie paxton Fear. Katie has her doctorate in insider threat investigation using natural language processing. She's a cybersecurity lecturer, uh, a white hat hacker, and a YouTuber teaching about API security and ethical API hacking, which you can find on her channel, Insider PhD. We are honored to have you, Dr. Katie uh, paxton Fear, with us today. With that, I'll turn it over to you, Katie, and take it away. Thank you. Uh, thank you for the introduction. I'm just going to share my screen. Um, so Dan has already given a great introduction to me, um, but because I like to do things again, um, that's why I have two degrees. Uh, my name is Katie. I am a, uh, I've got a PhD in uh, cybersecurity and machine learning. But you actually, if you already know me, you probably don't know me for my academic work. You likely know me because I make YouTube videos. I'm a uh, YouTuber, lecturer, general slideshow maker, and I talk a lot about web application security. But one of my favorite topics is API hacking. Uh, I started really my security journey in June 2019. So I'm quite new at this. I'm not like super experienced. And I really found very quickly that I had a knack for APIs, especially as I was a former developer coming into security. API hacking just clicked for me. So I make quite a lot of videos teaching other people how to get into API hacking. And that's what I'm going to be showing you today. This is really like a API hacking 101, the introduction to API hacking. If you've never seen an API before, this is a talk for you. So with that, let's start with what is an API? Now, if you might already know what an API is, in which case I invite you to just sit quietly um, while I explain it to people who don't. So API stands for Application Programming Interface. And what you tend to find in both security and development is that the acronyms don't always mean something for humans. So what an API is kind of um, in like normal human terms is it's this computer-friendly method of interacting with either a data source or some backend logic. It sits between like your mobile app, your web app, your desktop app, and lets it then communicate onward. So that way you only have to write one piece of code here. You don't need to rewrite the code for the mobile app and the web app. Oops. And what that really means is that developers can be lazy. They only need to write this one piece of code instead of writing the piece of code that's the same thing three times. They just don't need to. Um, and because it tends to be that kind of closer to either the database or backend logic, it's actually usually full of vulnerabilities. Um, and that's why I really like to hack it because it's easy and it's a great way to get started in kind of ethical hacking. 
So what do they look like? So often APIs are kind of use plain text because like I said, they're for computers. They're not really designed for humans, they're designed for computers. And with that, you kind of see these two types of data. You see JSON and XML. Now JSON is far more common now, but XML used to be really common in the past. Um, and as you can see here, this is an example of JSON. And this is a, another example of JSON. Um, and again, they return data directly from backend, the database or some backend logic. So what we really have to do is return records, right? So this kind of API endpoint here, so endpoint just means a piece, like a URL that returns something, is get employee one. It then has the employee name, and then it comes with that related items to it, the items that belong to the employee. And we can imagine this as a database, right? You're getting a specific employee with the ID of one from the database and getting things related to that employee. So it's really kind of quite close to how sort of like a database is structured. And again, down here, this is an example of a GraphQL API. And you do find these APIs that are slightly different in style. So there's um, quite a few more, we'll talk about them in a bit. Uh, but again, you're still seeing the kind of same data structure here. We have this repository owner, repository, name, description. You can imagine this as being a uh, database. Like you can see that it could be a database structure, right? Okay, so let's talk more about JSON. JSON is probably the easiest thing to recognize if like it signs an API. Now, the easiest way to tell is these curly brackets, right? So what these mean is this means an object. So a JSON always ends and begins with these curly brackets and everything inside of this is considered an object. So you can also uh, represent key value pairs. So here we have the key menu, then we have another swirly bracket. So the object is called menu and it contains more objects, okay? And then we see a more traditional key value pair. So that's the key, that's the value. Now, if you really wanna get into APIs, and you don't already know a lot about API security, you have to learn this because you have to be able to read it just like a computer can read it. So really take the time to become familiar with it because you can see that, you know, over here we have a list, you know, we have um, uh, commas here, you know, some key questions are, can you inject JSON into a page? What about XML? What about XML entity injection, right? That's an entire bug. So it's really important to understand how code is written, how it comes back from the database. So how do you actually find APIs? Now, APIs are everywhere. And I, I genuinely mean everywhere. Like they are in IoT devices. They're in mobile apps. They're in desktop apps. They're in web apps. They're in literally, if you're using something, you're using an API, whether or not you realize it or not. Some APIs are internal and some APIs are actually external for developers. You know, you can connect to make a Twitter bot by using Twitter's API. You can, um, you know, access a security camera from your phone because it's an IoT device, which is broadcasting an API that you can join. So they really are everywhere. Um, if you're looking for things specifically to keep an eye out, especially if you're kind of new to API testing, you're not really sure if what you've got is an API, um, the kind of things I look for is if something has a mobile app or has different applications, they're really useful because they're often, you know, they write the code once and then be done with it. Um, any web app with a lot of complex front end activity, you know, you've got Gmail. Gmail has tons of buttons on it. Like you can do so much on Gmail. How is it doing it? How is it queuing up those actions? How does it know? So any complex front end activity, you should be thinking API. Almost all mobile apps use APIs. Almost all IoT devices use APIs as well. And that includes like even stuff like pacemakers have APIs. Any web page that may, might have a longer load time can signify an API because it has to not just load, you know, that web page, but also the API. Sometimes you even see developer documentation. You know, if you want to make a Twitter bot, you go onto Twitter's website, they tell you about their API. Um, so let's talk about the types of APIs. So back in the day, you, these used to be more common. So SOAP was this kind of big standard for APIs. It's really not very common nowadays. It uses XML and it's got a kind of envelope format. So it has like a header and a body. Um, 
but that's really becoming like very, very uh, uh, uncommon nowadays. What we tend to find is something called RESTful APIs. Now, these are by far the most common APIs. They use JSON, which we talked about before, and they have these really defined structure. And we'll talk about that in a second. Um, so RESTful is this standard. It stands for Representational State Transfer. And again, doesn't mean a lot but it kind of is these APIs that are set up in a specific way. We also have GraphQL. Now, GraphQL is really the newcomer on the scene. So while RESTful APIs will have like a bunch of endpoints, GraphQL has just one. And that can be really powerful for people like using the API because they don't have to remember things. Um, and it has this kind of custom query language. And again, it always it uses JSON. You might see Web sockets are sometimes used as APIs. You can see like hardware APIs. Um, there's quite a lot of stuff in like um, car hacking that uses APIs. There are API structures for data transfer in, in healthcare. There is APIs built into programming languages. Like, trust me, APIs are everywhere and they come in so many different shapes and sizes. But I'm going to be talking today mainly about two of them, which is RESTful and GraphQL, because they are the most common. It's all about RESTful APIs. So RESTful APIs are really easy to spot because they have this defined structure here. So when you have a RESTful API, you're really signing up to this standard. And when we describe um, APIs, we're often talking about CRUD functionality. Now, CRUD stands for create, read, update, and delete. And you'll see me refer to all of these as CRUD or CRUD endpoints. So in a, a API then has a REST API then has to represent these four ideas. So the first one is the create, and it has a post request to the resource name just out on its own. So that's how we create something. We read something by doing a get request to the resource name and then the ID we want to see. Or if we don't have an ID, it should return everything. Again, these are kind of like a standard. So you'll once you like learn to spot RESTful APIs, if you're not already familiar with um, APIs, you like you will instantly be able to see these. Now the weird ones are update and delete, and some programmers among us will be able to say why these are special. But they use different HTTP um, uh, actions here. So we have put and we have delete. Now, put and delete actually aren't implemented in most browsers very well. So instead, we have these kind of weird hacks. So here you can see we can post to post one. We might actually have to add an edit to the end. We might have to post to a delete. We might have to get to a delete. That Those tend to be a little bit more custom. But you'll see in all of these, we have a resource name here, which is posts. And that's how we can tell we've got a RESTful API because we're seeing that resource name. Now, they're really easy to spot because they have this such defined structure. But actually, for especially for an outsider, it's actually quite easy to end up predicting new endpoints. Simply by knowing the application, you can just guess the resource names. You can guess the structure. For example, if you're looking at, say, YouTube's API, you know YouTube has videos, it has comments, um, it has like community posts, uh, it has subscriptions, right? And you can assume that, you know, if you see something like get video with an ID at the end, you might be able to say, okay, delete must exist, right? Because if I can create a video, I should be able to delete a video. We can also assume, you know, if dash video exists, then dash comment should exist. And we should be able to not just read each video, but also each comment. So what we can see from that is we can see this very predictable structure can be very useful because as an attacker, we don't really understand our attack surface. And that's how we gain that knowledge. That's how we know what's in our attack surface. Um, again, some endpoints tend to be more custom. You'll see in my demo that I'll actually show you what it looks like um, in Laravel because in Laravel, you can just tell it what method to use and it will run that method. Um, and they primarily return JSON. So you can get things like plugins to visualize it for you. You can um, like get on like online things that will then take a big block of it and then prettify it for you, et cetera. So that's RESTful APIs. Let's talk about GraphQL. So GraphQL, I said, was a relatively newcomer on the scene. And here if we look at the CRUD methods. 
the create, the read, the update, and delete are all on the same API endpoint. They're all on this kind of GQL or GraphQL or GQ, um, and then something after it. We then see this idea of mutations and queries. So in GraphQL, when we're returning data, that's a query. If we're changing data, that's a mutation. And we'll actually see the word mutation and then this create post or get this post or update this post, delete this post. Now, a really easy way to see whether or not you've got a GraphQL API is to just look for the word mutation, because there's very rarely web applications where you see the word mutation in that kind of context. For hackers, though, because of the way it's set up, it actually is really easy to enumerate. So GraphQL has tools built in that let you not just query um, the data, but the structure of the data itself. So you can get it to return every mutation on the database, every query on the database, every object you can use, all of the object's properties, which make it so much easier to enumerate. They also return JSON, but it looks a bit weird when compared to the kind of the restful JSON we saw. Um, if I go back to this slide, we can see this kind of first thing we get back is this data. So we'll always get data as an object and then the results are then here. It looks a bit different. We can also tell it what to get back. So if you look here, you can see we've got the repository owner with the login of Apollo stack, and we're getting the stargazers and the total count. And you can see this is reflected back in the data. Um, however, this is tough. Uh, if you've never looked at GraphQL before, it is definitely a challenge just to get used to what it looks like. Like GraphQL is not easy to use. Um, and I really recommend if you do anything from this video, you check out the Hacker 101 GraphQL CTF slides uh, or CTF levels. And they go over this so well about like how to hack GraphQL because it really is a great technology for hackers because no one ever touches it. The security is still relatively new. It's a great way to look, a great place to learn about API security. Um, and the other thing is really documentation. So APIs often have documentation for developers to use. This can be really great for the reconnaissance phase uh, because they just tell us what the endpoints are. So this is Twitter's API. And you can see here, they've just told us every everything we can do. We can do a um, destroyer list. We can create a list. And you can see here that this one is one of the weird API endpoints. You know, we don't have a delete here. We can update one. Like we can see how this works. And then we can see what all of the properties are. So we can really get quite a lot of information about API um, like setup just from documentation, which is published anyway. Uh, there are things like Stack Overflow, just Googling it, GitHub. Um, GitHub issues especially are great for figuring out how an API works. OK, so let's talk about testing APIs and how do you actually go from an API to finding vulnerabilities in an API? So first step on any kind of API security um, kind of like engagement is really to enumerate them. Now, what we really want to know is that we've got the entire attack surface of the API. Like we don't want to be in a position where we don't know what's there. We really want to make sure that we've got every API endpoint because we need to test them. So one of the best ways to do this is by using what we know about some of the API to predict more. So if users slash one slash edit exists, does orders slash one edit exist, right? That's the kind of logical leaps we're making. This does work a bit differently to RESTful and GraphQL APIs. And I'll talk more about that in a few moments. So enumerating RESTful APIs, they are really challenging to enumerate because as you can kind of imagine, we have to guess the resource names. Now, sometimes this might be really easy, right? This might be as simple as, oh, this is a forum. So I'll check post, I'll check replies, I'll check avatars, I'll check users, right? But actually this can be really challenging when you start to look at software, which isn't just like one piece of code, right? So then we have to look at these uh, common resource names. So what we do is we use these big long lists. So this is a fuzzdb um, common methods, which I think is from Seclists. 
and it has just a bunch of methods here. So it has account, accounts, activity, um, domain, uh, deposits, crypto, create. Like you can imagine this being API endpoints. Um, sometimes you can find tailored word lists, but actually some of the best ways to do it is by custom resource names. So instead of taking these big long lists, which may not even be relevant, this is 101 um, potential API endpoints. And if you just happen to have a slightly different API, it just won't work. Um, you can try and write your own. Does an API power forum? Try post, reply. One of the tools I've really liked and I've gotten a bit used to is Kite Runner. And Kite Runner is um, very similar to these lists but it can infer some more about API structure, which is really useful. But either way, whatever you do, what you're really doing is sending RESTful API endpoints to Burp Intruder or another brute forcing tool, importing a word list and replacing the working API endpoint with your word list and seeing whether or not anything comes back. And that's fundamentally how you enumerate a RESTful API. What about GraphQL? Now, enumerating GraphQL is much easier. So what we can do is do something called introspection. Now, I said before, this is you know, GraphQL. We don't have to just query a um, a, a single, uh, like, a, like, what's in the database. We can actually query structure around the database. So we can write this thing called an introspection query. And what it will do is it will run, it will return back every query that can be run in the database, what parameters it needs, um, how it all works, how it's all connected. And you can use a tool called GraphQL Voyager, which will visualize it in this kind of like really nice structure. So it will tell you how to go from, say, this node to this node to this node and then to this node. And you can kind of imagine in like a real application, this one might be users. So then you can get the actual user information. Then you can get their orders. Then from their orders, you can get their credit card information. You can make those jumps because they have linked data. Next thing is API versioning. So one of the API security top 10 is all about how you um, manage older versions of APIs, because if a bug gets fixed in version three, you certainly shouldn't have it still available because you know if you see version three, check for version one, what's been fixed between the two. Often they get, uh, they like stay available because of things like backwards compatibility. But unfortunately, that means security bugs can actually be left in there. And you might not even realize that API version one is, is accessible. So it's always worth checking for earlier versions of APIs, really trying to understand how the API has been deployed. Uh, this is really helpful if you're internal, because this is something that you probably already know. You probably already do or should be doing inventories of what code has been deployed and what API endpoints are out there. But for an attacker, this is the kind of thing they're going to look for. Now, speaking of what they're going to look for, what are we actually looking for? Now, I've taken here my top five issues that I think anyone can find. Um, we have information disclosure. So this is called in the API security top 10, excessive data exposure. Um, we have authorization issues, um, which is in the API security top 10 is API 2. Um, business logic errors, so where, you know, you might implement some business logic, uh, but then it doesn't have validation on the client side. Very, very common. Um, this might be an injection vulnerability, though usually it's things like being able to, like, manipulate prices. Um, IDORs or bowlers. Um, so these are the type, these are types of bugs where you can access a resource you shouldn't be able to access. I should be able to delete my videos and my comments, but you shouldn't be able to delete my videos and you shouldn't be able to delete my comments. But then I might be able to delete your comments if you comment on my video. And that kind of permission hierarchy is where it starts to get quite confusing for like access control. So access control issues always worth looking up. And five is, you know, classic injection. One of the um, things that APIs may not have is they might rely completely on the client side to actually, um, like, validate the code and ensure that it's actually running, right? So cross-site scripting, 
uh, service I request forgery, uh, SQL injection even, um, XML entity injection can also occur here. Like that's other issues. Um, so let's go through a bit more detail. So let's start with information disclosure. So information disclosure happens when essentially the API returns back too much information. It's relying on the client to filter the API, right? Like if I'm returning back a bunch of information about you, like let's say it's Amazon. So if I'm returning everywhere you've ever lived and ever ordered something, when you're only asking for your email address, that's a situation where you're disclosing too much information to the client. Um, it may be that they never display it or only display some of it. And how we usually test for that is we just call the API. We spend a lot of time just looking at what the API is actually producing and making a judgment call about whether or not it's a security risk. We ask questions like, could it help a larger attack? Does the target, does our client actually want this data public? Does it return a really large amount of data? And actually here, I put an example where this was um, the case. So this was uh, user information that was being disclosed. Again, it's not a huge um, issue here. Like it's not the, the worst, the worst kind of information disclosure. It's not credit card information, but certainly that can happen. And we have authorization. So authorization issues are when, you know, something should be protected with uh, a like security controls, but it's not. Um, and really what we're looking for is using the API to bypass a process. Um, so for example, generating tokens, what can we do with the tokens? Like what do we actually, um, what are we able to generate? Can we bypass, you know, OAuth especially is very, very common. You know, we might need an API to log in. Can we generate a token for another application via the API without having to interact with any kind of login service? Um, things like people leaving API tokens in uh, GitHub repositories by accident covers all kinds of issues. Business logic. So quite a lot of APIs, especially when it comes to ordering and like payment stuff, will only have the validation on the client side. Now, this can often cause things like um, uh, uh, SQL injection and cross-site scripting, but actually some of them can be as simple as letting somebody change a quantity to a minus number. So here, instead of having one of an item, they've actually gone into the API and changed it to having zero of an item, making the order free. If you do a minus number, you can then start to do maths where you're like, okay, this item is negative 77, this item is 78, so I'll have one of that and negative one of that, and then altogether I'll pay uh, one euro even if I only receive that item. Um, so my advice for testing these, see a number, make it really large, make it negative skip over steps like do you really need to pay will the api actually let you move on without paying will it does it actually need that callback idols so idols are by far the easiest and most common bugs in apis um these are always also called bolas uh, or bolas uh, and it's essentially the fact that you have some kind of resource that you don't have permission to see but you can still access it directly through the API. I've got an entire video. I've got several videos on idols and how they work and how to test for them. So I won't go into too much detail, but essentially every single time we see something like resource name one, we're gonna change that one to a two, to a three, to a four. Can we access somebody else's account? Well, some of the classic ways to do it is remove the cookies. Does it still work? Replace the cookies with a different user's cookies. Does it still work? Is it got permissions? What happens if you replace an admin endpoint with a low, lower permission user account? All kinds of um, different vulnerabilities can be caused by uh, all kinds of different ways to test these. Um, and they have earned their top spot on the API security top 10 just because of like how wide ranging the impact is. That could be as simple as, oh, someone can delete something they shouldn't all the way up to, oh, 
somebody can change people's like healthcare information. It really is this huge scale of impact. Um, and how do we test for like, then we have cross-site scripting and uh, cross-site request forgery. Now I'm not going to talk too much about CSRF um, because it's not really much of an issue because there's been some browser updates. But one of the most common defenses against cross-site scripting and SQL injection, in fact, is filtering. However, sometimes that only gets implemented on the client side. It doesn't actually get implemented in the API itself. So one thing that's really common to see is using the kind of um, API as like a, um, a way to, to evade a filter. And you can see this is a classic um, XSS payload that's just been put into the um, JSON here and it fired, right? So super, super common. Um, and it's so easy to do. Like it's just traditional cross-site scripting payload, put it into an API endpoint, see what happens. Um, and CSRF is also quite common in APIs. But again, that's kind of been um, mitigated somewhat through... Uh, the recent browser changes, I actually do have an entire video on like the changes that are made and how that impacts CSRF as a vulnerability. So I'm not going to talk too much about that. Other bugs to keep an eye out for, you know, I mentioned a few of these SQL injection, uh, classic injection vulnerability, very, very common. Um, not so common anymore if people use frameworks, but definitely quite common. Race conditions. So classic, again, API security top 10. Uh, lack of rate limiting can cause um, race conditions, but they can be a bit fiddly to get set up um, and actually working, but still excellent source of, of race conditions. Memory leaks are quite common as well. So we're not just talking about kind of traditional web application security vulnerabilities. We actually can think about things that are much wide ranger. Um, so when you deal with APIs, note taking is really, really important because you often have really large amounts of endpoints that have to be tested one after another. So I have the spreadsheet where I just literally say yes or no. Did it work? Was it vulnerable? And then some comments on it. And especially if you're doing something like a penetration test where you're like preparing a report for a client, really, really helpful. Um, so I just want to give some kind of further reading experimentation while I finish the kind of... Uh, slideshow aspect of this talk. Um, so my number one recommendation if you want to continue in API security is really getting comfortable with APIs, um, especially in testing APIs. You know, OWASP has this really great idea of having like builders and breakers. And if you're a builder, you have to learn how to be a breaker. And if you're a breaker, sometimes you have to learn how to be a builder. Um, for GraphQL, I really recommend the Hacker 101 GraphQL levels. Um, they helped me get my first GraphQL bug. I'm not even joking. I found it like a week after I first learned uh, GraphQL. I got like $1,000 for a bug. Um, for RESTful APIs, I think it's really helpful to actually build an API, to build an application, and to kind of hack it yourself and understand what kind of vulnerabilities you can accidentally introduce. Um, I really think a great way of learning more is... Uh, looking at some other disclosed bugs. Um, Hacker One have this activity. There's the API security newsletter. There's Integrity's Bug Bytes. Um, there's a ton of this like API security knowledge out there. And just having a bit of a read about it can really help in learning more about how to get started. And I can't stress this, stress this enough, that if you're interested in this, just start hacking. Like start out with a mobile app or a large web app, enumerate the API, start testing for something like IDOs, keeping an eye out for information disclosure. Sometimes regular functionality and intended functionality is a bug, not a feature. So I really recommend like getting started. Um, and with that, I'm gonna get started and show you how you can get started hacking um, well, right now, if you want to. So this is Generic University. It is a API security lab that I created. Um, and it is essentially a fake API. Um, you can see here, if I refresh the page, there's nothing that really, it's plain old web, regular website. 
But if we go over here and we go to the target and we go here, we can actually see there is an API endpoint here. And if we go into that and go into users, we can start to see an API. So we can see like it's being called API users and number six. What are we thinking immediately? This is a RESTful API. So what we can do is we can see what the response was. And we can see, you know, classic JSON, right? We see like a ton of information, ID, name, email address. Now, if we look back onto my slides, the first thing I recommend is trying to enumerate the API. Because right now, we only know that users six exists. So what else exists? Come on. Why won't it click? Right. This is so weird. Okay. One second, my mouse is broken. Okay, Slow. right. Sorry about that. Uh, so now if we go in here and we go send to intruder and we look at the positions and clear it. The first thing I recommended was enumerating the API. So we have users, we add this little simoleon sign, this little paragraph symbol. And that's telling us where the payload is going to go. If we go to payloads, we can now start typing our likely API endpoints. You might be thinking, OK, university. You might be thinking class, right? Classes, grades, grade, user, users. Um, any other ideas, Dan? What do you think? We can start with uh, this. Yeah, let's start with that. Um, and what we can see here is we're getting, you know, some 404s, but we're actually getting some 200s. So what we're thinking here then is, okay, so we can see some kind of information about grades. So what is that telling us? Well, we have the kind of the, the read. Okay, so let's see what else we can do with it. So if we send to repeater, this allows us to repeat the request. We press go. We can see we've got, again, JSON. So instantly we're thinking, OK, API, and it's following that kind of RESTful um, structure. So we know because we read the slides earlier that if we get rid of the number here and we press go, we should return everything. So this is every single grade. Now, this would likely be considered a vulnerability because this probably shouldn't all be public. <laughs> You shouldn't be able to see other people's grades. So this is a classic example of excessive data exposure. You shouldn't be able to see that. That is definitely a vulnerability that would need to be fixed. Now, we can see from here, you know, we know we can read the grade. We might be able to think, OK, can we create grades? Can we edit grades and can we delete grades? Like, can we do the other CRUD functionalities? So if we go to API grade six again, let's try and change this one. So I said to do this, we want to use a put. Now, we haven't got any kind of information in here about what it's accepting. So I'm going to write content type application JSON from here, like so. And I'm going to go, it's definitely on the new line. There it is. I'm going to go here and make a swirly bracket and go. Change the grade from 33 to, let's say, 100. So it's a JSON object. We know we end and start with a curly brace. And we know that these are the keys and the values. So the grade is currently equal to uh, 33. Let's make it to 133. And we'll press go. And we'll see instead the API is then returning 133 as a grade. Idea rise percentages went up that high. So this is an example of a bowler, right? broken object level authorization. You shouldn't be able to do this. Um, you could say maybe it's actually broken function level authorization, because 
In fact, shouldn't teachers be able to edit grades, but students shouldn't. Um, but because we're not logged in, it's not related to the function, but the object. So that's another classic example of a um, of a, uh, a broken API here. Um, but we can go further. So another example is mass assignment. So mass assignment, another classic API vulnerability, that's the ability to add additional information into um, a kind of put request and change it, even though we shouldn't be able to. So we shouldn't be able to change, say, the created app. But we can try here, let me go here, and put the created app, and let's change it to a year ago. We press go, and you can see here that we haven't been able to change the created app. So this is not vulnerable to mass assignment on that particular example. But what about everything else? We can might be able to change the user ID. And this is how we do it. We just go here. We just test things. So this is user ID 2. Let's change it to user ID 1. Press go. So that one's not assignable. We go to uniclass ID and we do that to ID 3 and press go. And that's not assignable. So great. Although the API is very vulnerable, you can change people's grades. You can't change things you shouldn't be able to change. Like you could say, okay, the comments you should be able to change, but you can't change other things. So great. We can change an ape the uh, someone's grade, but what else can we do with this? So we can go in here and we can kind of start clicking around. We see a kind of contact IT here. We see a report of security vulnerability, and we can see here that, you know, somebody has already put stuff in. So what we might want to check, like, here is can we do something like injection? So can we do a classic, you know, script alert? Wow. One script. Do this and we'll do it there and we'll type in whatever. See a bit more, see what it wants. But great, we didn't get an error, but we don't actually know whether or not that's worked. So we can have a look here, go into um, proxy and HTTP history and see what actually happened. Um, if we just, yeah, there we go. Well, we posted to dash vulnerability. So maybe one thing we look for next is an API endpoint for vulnerability, right? That's a resource name. Maybe we should be able to see it. What if something's got an admin, right? So if we go here, back here, and we add some more, clear the payload list, and maybe we go vulnerability, vulnerabilities. Um, maybe we'll add admin, and then we'll do our start attack again. You can see here, okay, maybe it's not an API endpoint, but maybe it's because it's got that kind of six at the end. So we go here. This is quite a lot of what API hacking looks like. Like it's it's not very technically complex. It's quite a lot of like, does that work? Why doesn't that work? Let's try this, let's try that. So we can actually see here there is an admin endpoint. So we might be able to see something there. Unfortunately, there isn't an API endpoint for vulnerabilities. It's all, you know, 404 not found. So that might not be an API endpoint, but there's certainly something in administrator. So how do we actually log into the account? We've got a 401 error here, which is unauthenticated, not unauthorized, unauthenticated. So what does that mean? Well, that means we need to get an account. Now we have a login button here. And classic, right? Okay, we can log in, but it doesn't look like we can register anywhere. Apart from you go up here and go register. The form is still there. It's just been hidden. And this is like the classic API security, right? Like the um, the fact that like it, it, something's hidden from you, but it's still there. So we have to put in a name here. Doesn't really matter. An email. Test at test.com. Put in a password, one, two, three, four. Test one. One, two, three, four. Four, one, two, three, four. One, two, three, four. 
Okay, so now we're in. Now we have like a valid, um, a, a valid uh, uh, like new token here, new session token. As you can see, it's a JWT. We might be able to go back to uh, like our API here. I remember we're looking for. If I just right click on this and send to repeater, going back here and looking for admin. I press go, and wouldn't you know, we're actually able to access the uh, administrator endpoints. So we can see here we've got like an endpoint name and then a description. And you can see here there is an endpoint to delete everything. So why not delete everything, right? Oh no, we don't have permission. We can't delete everything. So this is where um, API security ends up overlapping with like traditional application security um, and traditional like um, examples where we need to actually elevate our privileges. So how are we going to do that? Well, we saw we've got an API here, API users. We never actually tested whether or not this was also vulnerable. So if we go to API users and get everyone, we can see all the way down here, we have our account, which has got the ID of nine. We do API users nine and press go. We can see we've got our, our account, but we've got a role ID of two. Now that could mean anything really. We don't really know, but chances are that role ID two is not administrator. So if we go in here and we do the same thing, we can actually do a post request. This is where uh, Laravel ends up being kind of fun. We do a post request and then in the body here, we do underscore, underscore, underscore method and we put in put. It will then treat this like a put request. So we can change this to say, and we do role ID and instead of role ID two, we'll have role ID one with the assumption that role ID one is likely an illustrator. And we'll press go. You can see here, even though we sent a post request, we were still able to have it treated like a put request. A fun like penetration testing fact, if you end up looking at Laravel, you can still access um, these via these method uh, things. Okay, so now we've got one. Now let's go back to here. And now we've deleted everything. And if we go all the way back, go back to when we got all of the users, we can see we're the only one that remains. So thank you very much for listening. Um, we've got 10 minutes, quite happy to answer any questions anybody has. Um, and I'm just going to put up a lovely slide in the meantime. Yes, thank you, Katie. That was uh, great information. Uh, lots of great information there. Uh, so we hope that this detail will help security leaders and developers better understand the risks that APIs can pose uh, if their APIs are not created and handled correctly. Uh, and uh, with that, yeah, let's move to Q&A. Um, one question that I think uh, should be addressed is, uh, uh, one of your slides said, just start hacking. And, and I love that, like get into it, get your hands dirty. Like you're gonna learn by doing, right? How do we avoid getting in trouble? Well, the first thing is, is that um, many, the law in many, many countries is that hacking is only actually illegal if you don't have permission. You need to get permission. You can do that through a bug bounty program. You can do that if you develop your own API and test it, or if you test a friend's API, or if you work in open source, there are open source bug bounties where you can literally like deploy an open source um, uh, like piece of code and then report security vulnerabilities. Uh, as long as you have permission, it's completely okay to hack. And I do stress that when you start to go without permission, you go into more security research. You don't do that unless you can afford a lawyer that you can call immediately when you get into legal problems, because you may get into legal problems. But if you're just hacking um, on things you have permission, CTFs, bug bounties, um, your own applications, it's completely fine. There is no legal issue there. Great, thanks for that. I think that's yeah, very vital information. Uh, know what you're doing, what you're getting into here. Uh, kind of somewhat related, is this data that you're teaching uh, going, isn't it gonna enable bad people to do bad things? I would hope that developers 
would be a one step ahead. Um, I think it's really important to promote security as something that really everyone should be doing. Like it's not just the application security person's job to do security. Developers should be thinking about this stuff too. And we really should be assuming that bad people already know all this. They're not watching, you know, this webinar that's an hour long on how to hack APIs. They're really going for the shortcuts. I really hope my work always reaches, you know, developers, people who wouldn't normally be thinking about security, but who go, wow, actually, now I've seen that, I've probably written code that does that, because that's the same experience that I had when I found my first bug. I was like, wow, all of my code I've ever written is vulnerable to a, a bowler or an idol. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Here, a great point. Yeah, we, we've we've got to know where the the risks and the vulnerabilities are in order to do better, so that they're not created in the first place, right? Mm -hmm. um, absolutely. Uh, so, so I want to point it out. Your demo was using Burp Suite Professional. Um, yeah. Do we need the professional version to do what you showed us? No, absolutely not. You can do it completely with the free version. I use the professional version because it's slightly faster. Um, and um, it's a bit easier for demos, but I absolutely, like I did not find my first um, security vulnerability with spending $500 on software. It's not something you can really afford, um, but I spent like, I bought it, bought the, did the community edition and bought it with my first bounty. I just use it for demos because it's faster and the um, intruder is that is quite a lot slower on the community version. There are free tools that can replace it as well. Like there is absolutely like tools that can um, replace all of the functionality of the premium version of Burp. Like it, you really don't need to pay money for it. Great, great for uh, folks getting started. Great. Um, uh, you mentioned Laravel a few times. What exactly is Laravel? So Laravel is a PHP framework, and it's basically in ye olden days, um, PHP and a lot of other programming languages were written kind of raw in the sense that you just wrote like generic PHP code. Nowadays, um, what tends to happen is that frameworks have been built. And what frameworks do is they encapsulate a lot of the common issues you have, things like connecting to a database without causing SQL injection, things like um, having a form that's not vulnerable to cross-site scripting, as well as handling quite a lot of other things related to like HTTP, web sockets, um, like notifications, all that fun things, and provides, ironically enough, an API, but not the kind we're talking about, uh, not a RESTful API, but a way of connecting to all of these different um, little like easy ways for developers to do stuff. So it's a really great way of like... Um, uh, creating software quite quickly. And it tends to be how modern software is built. Modern software isn't really built with just PHP files anymore. They're built in with things like Laravel, with things like routing. And if I just show you, I can show the code on screen. You can see here that the code that powers this, there's tons of files. And there's not that much functionality in these files. It's just the um, it, there's so much that I could do with it. So like, for example, some of these files have like one line, um, but it just, it provides that kind of framework behind it. Great, thank you. Um, great, so uh, with that, uh, I think uh, we will bring this to a close. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Gady uh, paxton Fear, for this great content. Um, this concludes the webinar. Uh, we'd like to thank you for joining and hope that you'll join us again for the next uh, in the series uh, on June 15th, where Katie will be covering API reconnaissance. So once again, thank you for your time and attention. Uh, have a good rest of your day uh, or evening. Thank you, everybody.